Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back uh, to the third lecture on this course on international relations. Uh, so far what we have done in the first two lectures is to introduce you to the concept of international relations. In the first lecture we looked at uh, the long history of the discipline starting from 1919. Uh, we also looked at the various ways in which one can look at IR itself. So there have been several theories uh, in the last 100 years which have emerged. And uh, today's class is the first class on theory where we are plunging straight into how to examine IR and uh, we are going to start with a theory called realism. Uh, the reason we are, why we are starting with this theory is because it has the oldest tradition, it has one of the oldest traditions in IR. Uh, it has a long consistent narrative within uh, international relations and that is the reason. Uh, realism is uh, quite frankly like the name suggests a realistic account of uh, the human civilization, the human, the question of humanity and that relates to war and violence. Almost every epic uh, whether it is Homer's Iliad, whether it is the Mahabharat, uh, all ancient epics and narratives and ballads try and answer the fundamental question of what is the relationship of violence and humankind, what is the place of violence in civilization and how does one categorize, how does one theorize uh, violence, is it a necessity, can one do away with it. And if we look into our traditions within the South Asian subcontinent, we see that the Mahabharat is an epic which is persistently trying to answer that question of uh, what is violence, uh, is war a necessity, uh, can one do away with war and is suffering, is there a, a price of suffering, is there a necessity to suffer. So the central questions, the central lead motive one could say for realism is violence and war and naturally these questions emerge because of the brutality at the battlefield, in the battlefield, uh, the death of the ones we love and uh, the, the cost of war to civilization as a whole. So in today's lecture what I'm going to do is take you through history uh, starting from uh, ancient, uh, the ancient Greek, uh, Greek epics which deal with this question. Uh, then we'll come down to IR as a, a modern academic discipline and try and understand how theorists have tried to analyze uh, violence and war. So before we set out on this journey, uh, the two questions that we are looking at, that we are circling upon very much like vultures are like uh, other issues of violence and war. And uh, we will start with uh, Krishna who in the Mahabharat uh, placates a very vexed, a very perplexed, a very worried uh, uh, Arjun when he asks about the, the consequences of taking on his very own family in the battlefield and Krishna assures him that a war is, necessi is necessary and at times one has to do one, one, what one has to do irrespective of the ethical and the emotional uh, questions involved. So in many ways this uh, distinction between ethics and what is necessity is at the core of realism that even though there is an admission that violence is horrific, uh, violence is barbaric, uh, violence is uncondonable, there is a place for it, there is a value for it, it is necessary in uh, the way we conduct our everyday lives. Now interestingly enough we see an echo of this very uh, idea in the Miletian dialogue and this Miletian dialogue is a dialogue which is uh, recorded in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, 
uh, the war which took place between the Spartans and the militants. And this war was recorded uh, quite assiduously by Thucydides. And uh, in this, the episode that we're looking at is when the Spartans, and we know that the Spartans were a very disciplined uh, military uh, trained, uh, uh, athletically inclined uh, uh, group of people who defeat the militants. The militants are peace loving, they're, they are meek, they are uh, kind, they're not oriented to war. And when they are subjugated, the militants appeal to justice and they say that this is not fair. It is not fair for us to be conquered in this fashion. Uh, and this brutality is certainly not condonable. And it is here that the Spartans say what Krishna has just told Arjun, uh, we mentioned that, uh, I mentioned it a few minutes ago, that justice is what the what uh, might dictates and questions of ethics cannot be interlaced into the question of politics. Now both of these uh, uh, illustrations from ethics incidentally um, illustrate as to how uh, ancient civilizations have dealt with the question of violence and they have dealt with it by dealing with it clinically which is that they have separated it from the realm of politics. Ethics is separate from the realm of politics and one sees this down till when we look at uh, Morgenthau's classic text uh, published in 1948, Politics Amongst Nations. Now before we proceed further, uh, both these examples also illustrate as to even before the emergence of the modern state system as we know it, groups, clans, tribes, uh, societies were warring with each other. And essentially this ethical concern was pushed aside by those who favored the language of the powerful. So what one sees is that questions of justice, mercy, humanity are seen as questions as of those who are weak, who are meek. And even though the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth, uh, we see that in the realist tradition there is a uh, rejection of the weak's petition for uh, justice and this is a consistent narrative. Now just moving on, uh, in the 14th century we see Machiavelli, the Italian writer, the Italian political theorist echoing the same ideas where he defines power as brute domination over others and uh, power in these narratives is seen as a form of control, as a form of domination and it has to be the pursuit of power which defines politics. So one can see very clearly that there is an emerging but artificial distinction maintained between questions of ethics and questions of power and the pursuit of power is celebrated as that which is right, that which is necessary for, the, for an ordered society. Ordered society can only come from, uh, from uh, the source of power and one can see that this is a place where, this is a time where uh, there is a necessity to uh, celebrate power for the purpose that it serves and that is of course uh, maintaining law and order. Now, uh, through the several centuries between the 14th and the 19th century, which is where we'll be dwelling upon mostly, uh, one finds that um, theorists throughout time have been looking at war and violence as necessary to the uh, continuation of uh, human existence or human civilization as we know it. Uh, there is the Chinese text Sun Tzu, The Art of War, which similarly places strategy uh, the military, the army as necessities to a stable state. And one can see quite clearly why that was the case. This was a case, this was a time when uh, societies were trying to stabilize themselves and uh, it was obviously not possible without a brute naked uh, force. And we see that similarly being echoed by Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes the 16th century English philosopher who argues that life is nasty, brutish and short and uh, the only way one can make uh, do with what we have is by uh, 
relegating or uh, giving our authority over to the state and the state is this all encompassing uh, Leviathan and the Leviathan is a biblical monster and it's very interesting that Hobbes portrays the state as a biblical monster emerging from the sea and the reason is that the state is something which is not quite human and therefore we cannot expect it to be humane and on account of its natural brutality, its natural bestiality, uh, violence and war are endemic to states and uh, human nature. The argument here then is that humans, uh, the state and flowing from that, uh, the world that we inhabit is a world in which violence is endemic and uh, I'd like to pause over here and look at this word endemic. We've looked at this word endogamous in the previous lecture where we contrasted it with the word exogamous and a uh, realist theory like several other theories starts off by looking at what constitutes uh, international relations. Uh, we start off with the first image and that is that of humans and of course I'm referring to uh, Waltz's uh, conceptualization here. So the first image is uh, is at the human level, that's, uh, that's us. The second image is that of the state uh, and the third image is that of the structure. Now these three categories, the uh, unit, the state and the system are categories around which the subsequent theories will be aligning themselves. So it's quite worthwhile to spend a few minutes just trying to understand what it means. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to ask the question, what is the source of violence? Where does violence come from? And Hobbes would say that man by nature is selfish. And over here, male theorists, his reference point is men our men rather and to him it is men who are uh, brutal, who are nasty, who are violent and if it is by nature and by nature we mean something which is unchangeable, something which is uh, immutable, of course this is the 16th century, uh, genetic modification did not exist at that time and even then uh, it is questionable whether uh, science can change the nature of our beings. So the fundamental question being, uh, which the fundamental point being made was that at the core of our hearts, uh, we are violent, uh, greedy, uh, narcissistic, uh, quite unpleasant and unkind people and therefore violence is endemic and therefore the word endemic would mean it is inherent in us uh, to be appropriative, to be exploitative and therefore a world without violence is unnatural and subsequently inconceivable and perhaps something not worthy to be pursued at all. Uh, so Hobbes has outlined uh, the idea that we by nature are violent and this is, something, this is an idea which has been toyed uh, fairly well by theoreticians, philosophers, poets throughout time. But now we come to the academization of international relations. What we've seen so far are people who are thinking about violence and war, but not as theoreticians of international relations. So we come to the starting point of where it all began, where IR began. And that is, of course, uh, in 1919 at the end of the First World War. Uh, a very interesting period, a rich period with several ideas bursting upon mulling abated and that is the First World War which took place between 1914 and 1918. Now uh, the Great War uh, challenged uh, the ideas of violence and war in the minds of Western uh, Americans and British philosophers who were mulling over the nature of this war and more importantly were possibly aghast at the fact that 
Europeans were capable of this violence. So the First World War uh, costed millions of lives, but it is not as if uh, bloody wars like this had not taken place. Uh, we know that in the 18th century, uh, the 16th century, there was the Hundred Year War. Of course, it wasn't for 100 years, but it took a wide, it uh, occupied the energies of Europe for a wide span of period. And then you have the Thirty Years War between 1618 and 1648. So the point here is that war itself was not new to Europe, but nonetheless, the First World War vexed, troubled uh, thinkers during this period and therefore IR, international relations, was set up as an academic discipline in 1919 and the first department was set up in Aberystwyth in Wales. And when it was set up, it was set up with a unreal idea of preventing the occurrence of such a war. And it is here that we come to the first realist theoretician who we will be looking at to, in today's lecture, and that is E. H. Carr. Now, just a little bit of a background uh, as to uh, why we are looking at E. H. Carr and why this period is so important. Uh, e. H. Carr is one of the three theorists we will be looking at. The others would be um, Hans Morgenthau, 1948 is the publication of his book, and subsequently we'll be looking at Kenneth Walls, who published his book in 1979. So these three moments, uh, uh, whether it is 1939 when E. H. Carr publishes his book, to Ma Morgenthau, who is an American, uh, to Waltz, who is an American, uh, indicates where realism is coming from and what it sets out to achieve. And let's therefore have a look at E. H. Carr first and try and understand where his sense of realism stems from. Now, Edward Hallett Carr was a British diplomat. He was part of the Versailles negotiations. He saw how British foreign policy worked closely as a practitioner. And in 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed. And uh, the Treaty of Versailles is important because the victor states, that is France, uh, Britain, and most importantly, America, uh, imposed upon Germany a set of conditions which involved not only demilitarization, uh, they uh, sent the King uh, Wilhelm II to exile to uh, the Netherlands, but most importantly, they imposed a peace upon uh, Germany which involved Germany being a democracy amongst other things. Now, 1919 was a year when peace was being celebrated. After the year, many years of war, there was a moment of great, great peace. The victors were satisfied. Uh, they were looking for uh, a, a, a justice and a retributive justice from the violence unleashed by Germany and its allies. And it is here that E. H. Carr uh, writes his book, The Twenty Year Crisis which was published right at the eve of the Second World War, which started in 1939. So what is E. H. Carr trying to say um, and why is he saying what he is? Um, this is a moment of great peace. Uh, the 20 years between the two world wars was seen as a period of enforced peace. And it is here that Carr is raising several pertinent questions about the nature of peace and the nature of war. And the first question that E. H. Carr raises is, uh, is this really peace or is this an imposition? And the word imposition means something which is hoisted upon you, forced upon you. Has this force, has this peace been forced upon the losers of the war or is it a genuine peace? Now that itself is a pertinent question, the nature of peace itself. Carr was trying to argue uh, very elegantly that when victors enforce peace, that isn't real peace at all because every loser, every, st every state which loses in a war would rise up and try and defy that enforcement 
and that, that is what he calls revisionist state. So, a revisionist state is a state which is discontent with the impositions and limitations of its boundaries, its demilitarization and such a state would very naturally challenge those and there would again be a war between the revisionist states and those who do not quite see it the same way. Very succinctly, Carr outlined as to how moments of peace were essentially the evolution of war and that is precisely what happened in 1939 when the Second World War broke out. It was challenged, the order was challenged by those revisionist states who were discontent by the peace of the First World War and we know that those are the states of Germany. Italy and Japan, they were hostile, uh, ambitious and rightly so, every sovereign state aspires to uh, extend its boundaries and certainly Germany, Japan and Italy were not unusual or not uh, different in that way. But Carr was reminding his readers and the world that peace is always an illusion and there can be no peace because violence is again endemic to the structure. Now, Carr's book is seen as one of the early classic uh, textbooks on realism. Uh, he was not a theoretician, uh, he was primarily a historian and of course, we already know that he was a diplomat. So, his narrative, his uh, perspective uh, dwells a lot upon history, but he is still, we would not still quite call him a theoretician. Uh, and therefore, we come to the next uh, key uh, realist thinker we are looking at in today's class and that is uh, Hans Morgenthau. And Hans Morgenthau writes his uh, classic text, Politics Among Nations in 1948. Uh, so, let us just pause here for a moment and try and identify two major uh, currents within realist thought. The first is from the Mahabharata to Thucydides to the Peloponnesian War to Sun Tzu, there is number one, an understanding that violence is an essential feature of uh, human, uh, human life, human civilization, that is the first uh, undercurrent of realism. And the second of course is that the only thing we can do is to regulate it. We can regulate violence, but we cannot uh, stamp it out the way we would stamp out a disease. In short, violence is a part of our lives and it is possibly, it is impossible to do away with it. <laughs> now, both of these um, uh, undercurrents uh, reflect in Morgenthau's uh, text. Uh, most importantly, Morgenthau looks at politics as being distinct from ethics. Now, we see that this has echoes of what takes place between the Spartans and the militants and what takes place in the Mahabharata. Essentially, that ethics if we define ethics as the concern for justice, what is right and wrong, what is moral and what is immoral, then politics has to be distinct from that. And therefore, Morgenthau puts forward his six principles of political realism. Uh, he is a theorist who is trying to codify realism. He is uh, also an American who is writing just at the end of uh, the Second World War. And we also know that at the end of the Second World War, America is taking on a role which it had not before. Uh, America joins the uh, Second World War in 1941, much after it has begun. It began in 1939 uh, reluctantly. And by the end of the Second World War, uh, the USA is prepared to engage on a global level with the world. Uh, which was fairly unprecedented. The classic example uh, illustration for that is of course the fact that the Bretton Woods institutions, the Bretton Woods uh, negotiations took place in America. 
where it designed certain institutions, the IMF, the World Bank and the GATT, which then became the WTO in 1995, as a ways in which uh, capitalism would be uh, institutionalized through these global uh, networks, through these international financial uh, bureaucratic giants. So, Morgenthau is writing his book in 1948 and the context to that period is the fact that America is taking on a global role and he is also trying to look into the nature of foreign policy, the nature of uh, power, the nature of uh, a global great power set, the way America was positioning itself and therefore, uh, Morgenthau's six principles summarize uh, what realism has been uh, has been murmuring, has been uh, whispering till this point. And of course, these six principles uh, are the first codification in academic IR as we know it. Morgenthau's uh, principles of political realism are steeped in the idea that IR can be like science. One sees this clearly when we will be discussing the six principles. Uh, like several scholars before him, uh, Morgenthau was trying to codify IR uh, principles of politics in a manner mimicking science. Science is uh, studies nature, can make predictions, works, uh, scientists work in laboratories. There is a certain word, a world that they inhabit. Uh, Morgenthau's inspiration for political realism distinctly, uh, discernibly comes from science, especially when we look at his first one. So his first uh, principle is that politics has objective uh, laws and uh, violence comes from human nature. And again, this particular word objective that Morgenthau talks about, that politics is objective and we will see that in the subsequent uh, points that he makes about political realism. Now, it's a very interesting claim that Morgenthau uh, makes through his principles. Now, that itself is a claim about on an understanding of what international politics is. Morgenthau is telling us that politics uh, is objective and violence has roots in human nature, which means that it is something which is uh, inescapable, which is uh, endemic and fundamentally part of uh, our everyday existence, part of societies and states. And war is uh, a feature, one can apologize about it, but it is a permanent feature in uh, uh, international politics. Uh, the second one, uh, Morgenthau examines the concept of interest, where he says that a state's interest is constant it is universal and a state's interest will always be guided by its strategic and military interest. Now, it is here that uh, Morgenthau is codifying the state's interest above uh, the people it governs, the, sub the, citizens, um, the, the citizens within the state and he is arguing that uh, the state's strategic interest, the state's national interest comes much before everything and it is the uh, uh, nation's uh, foreign policy which will guide it to that. So these two things, uh, military and strategic interest are something which are inextricably linked to what a state's national interest is and there are no questions posed at this point about whether that should be taken as it is or there are certain assumptions that Morgenthau is making. Uh, the third point that Morgenthau talks about is that ethics and politics occupy a very different uh, realm and there can be no question uh, of ethical concerns when it comes to national interest and national policy. And there again we are reminded of uh, the question of the just war that certain wars are undertaken in the name of justice and we can only think of the recent in this very uh, century, the war against terror uh, led by the American President George Bush in the name of justice, in the name of setting things right. 
that certain uh, ethical concerns uh, can guide war. But over here, Morgenthau is telling us that politics and ethics do not naturally belong to each other and there can be uh, no confusion, there can be no fuzzy boundaries between the two. And even if a state upholds a certain moral order, it cannot be universal. So we come to the uh, third point where uh, Morgenthau tells us that uh, even though a, a particular state can uphold a certain moral order, that moral order cannot be universal. And in a sense, a state's internal intention of structuring peace cannot be uh, universalized. So we hear the term universalization means uh, applicable to all states uh, across time and the opposite of the word universal would be particular. So over here, Morgenthau outlines as to how even if a particular state has a certain ideal uh, to achieve, that in itself is a failed project because uh, there is no space for a state's moral conceptualizations in the world of international politics. Uh, therefore, we come to the fifth point where he tells us that uh, even though a state's interest, uh, particular interest may change across time, uh, a state's military and strategic interest will be constant, which means that every state must prioritize its national interest or else it will suffer uh, consequences of being attacked or being conquered and therefore uh, it is the obligation of the state, a state must therefore be militaristic, uh, be strategic and there is no way, there is no alternative to that. And finally, we come to the sixth principle which argues that uh, morals cannot be universalized and uh, in effect, Morgenthau makes three. If we look at these uh, six principles and we, if we would come to the core of it, the core of it would be that politics is a space which is autonomous from ethics and moral concerns. So what does this word autonomous mean? Uh, autonomous means separated, uh, something which can function independently and is not uh, either dependent or inclined toward another sphere. And the term autonomy over here also refers to the ability of Morgenthau to make this artificial divide between politics and ethics. Every political act is a ethical act because there are lives uh, concerned, but the separation, this artificial separation of politics and ethics is that sphere upon which realism rests. So realism rests upon this artificial separation between politics and ethics and of course each one of us is a moral being where we ask questions about the righteousness the rightness of actions taken by the state, be it a genocide, be it a, a violation of human rights and these are questions which concern uh, each one of us. Uh, so in many ways realism is arguing that politics is separated from ethics and that is the only way we can carry out brute acts of violence by classifying it as a question of real politic, that is politics is real and other questions are useful but need not come in the way in the exercise of the state's brutal might. In short, Morgenthau argues that the state's power cannot be questioned, cannot be held accountable by questions of justice, of uh, rights, of the weak, of the disabled, of the, uh, of the people who are suffering because it is autonomous and therefore makes it extremely convenient for realists to argue
that politics and ethics are separated. Of course, this is a question that we constantly question this separation and we therefore come to the third and the last, perhaps the most groundbreaking theorist in within realism, uh, Kenneth Waltz, who publishes his book uh, Man's State and the War in 1979, A Theory of International Politics. But before that, uh, just a little bit about the context. Uh, as we've looked in the previous uh, lecture on theories of IR, when we look at a theory of IR, the theoretician is as important, his, his or her life, his, uh, the scope of her inquiry, the object of her inquiry is equally illuminating as much as the book itself. So what a person is saying comes from a certain location, uh, experience, uh, a space and time and drawing our attention to that allows us to understand why or what that person is saying. Now Kenneth Waltz is also an American and unlike Morgenthau, he is writing in the 1970s and he is trying to reclaim the space for realism. The reason why he is doing that is because by the 1970s, it becomes increasingly clear that there are certain non-state actors who are occupying a space of influence comparable to the state itself. Now these would be the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, or uh, the GATT, sorry, because the WTO comes much later, uh, the United Nations, um, the International Labour Organization. So there is a multiplication of international organizations as non-state actors which are facilitating flows and networks in a way which hadn't been imagined before. So Waltz's book is a quest to reclaim that space. And wh what do we mean by reclaim? Uh, when something has been lost and you try and retrieve it is what we mean by reclaim. So Waltz is reclaiming that space uh, for realism and his theory of realism is uh, a pivotal work, uh, a paradigmatic work and around which subsequent theories have uh, revolved around either accepting, refuting or borrowing parts of realism and therefore uh, neo-realism uh, that is Waltz's uh, amendments to realism and his contribution to realism is called neorealism is a pivotal uh, axis upon which realism uh, rests upon. So what does Waltz tell us? Um, now like Morgenthau, Waltz is modeling his theory on economics, on specifically microeconomics. And if Morgenthau was inspired by science, uh, Waltz is inspired by the physiocrats in the 17th and 18th century who made an artificial boundary between political economy and other uh, pursuits of knowledge in order to study it. What does that mean? That means that Waltz uh, constructs a certain space within which he is going to build his theory and obviously that uh, space is artificially constructed but as Waltz tells us that the test of any theory is its explanatory value. How does one uh, evaluate a theory is whether it is explaining to us the reality that we seek to understand. And over here, his reality is the domain of international politics. So first things first, uh, Kenneth Waltz wields his scalpel and he demarcates a space within which he is going to evaluate or uh, explain uh, what international politics is. Having, having done that, he proceeds to talk about the three images. Now the three images are Waltz's way of 
uh, dividing international politics into a certain space in order to understand and in order to put forward his theory. Now, it's very important to understand uh, why Waltz is doing this. Uh, Waltz uh, makes three compartments, uh, slices international politics into three images, the first being man, uh, the second being the state, that's the second level, and the third being the system or the structure. Now, Waltz argues that a major problem in the manner in which IR has been theorized is that it has looked at states determining the outside, which is an endogamous perspective, which is that if X states desires peace, peace is possible. Kenneth Waltz calls this a reductionist argument and he dismisses it. He says that the world cannot be changed by the intentions, the zeal and the determination of one state. Then what is causing war? And it is here that Waltz poses his question and his question is about the remarkable similarity in behavior of the USA and the USSR during the Cold War in spite of their ideological differences. Now, the year is uh, 1979, it's the mid-1970s, it is in, right in the middle of the Cold War and Waltz makes a striking observation that the USA is a democrat capitalist state, the USSR is a communist state. But in spite of their internal engineering and in spite of the internal ideological apparatus, both of their foreign policies are remarkably similar, which is that both of them are determined to uh, further their national interest through strategic and military means. And it is here that Waltz draws our attention and puts forward his a uh, irrefutable argument that the source of war and violence is not in the individual, not in the state, but stems from the structure. Now, what he means by the structure is that every state behaves in a certain way, not because of the way they are designed internally but because of the forces that shape it from the outside and those are exogenous to it. In short, the structure or the ordering principle of the structure is what uh, forces states, compels states to take on a militaristic and strategic outlook and therefore we come to the first point of, uh, there are three points to th Waltz's theory. The first point is the ordering principle. What is the ordering principle of a space? So, Waltz says that within a state, the ordering principle is hierarchy. You jump a light, you get, uh, you're issued a notice, um, there is a certain law and order in place and you're subjected to it and that is what he calls hierarchy. There is a, a sovereign state and it exercises power over us. The ordering principle of the international system, however, is anarchy. And anarchy is the state where there is no higher being above the state. There is no world police. There is no world, uh, there is no authority higher than state. So, in effect, States are units and Waltz uses the word units for states that these units in the international structure are, have to depend on themselves in order to survive and therefore survival is of foremost concern to these units. So, in short, the ordering principle compels states to act in a certain way irrespective of whether they are democracies, whether they are dictatorships, uh, irrespective of how they are shaped internally, it is the structure. Now, this argument is
powerful uh, it is persuasive because it is shifting the focus of violence from the individual to something beyond its control and that is from the outside so waltz tells us that the ordering principle of the structure is anarchy and on account of that every state is compelled to survive by taking on military militaristic and strategic interests which are not ethical but nonetheless are necessary for its survival and therefore we come to the second principle that all units are alike in that way uh, irrespective of how they are shaped internally uh, units are similarly bound and socially conditioned to place survival before uh, other uh, ethical and uh, concerns of justice and this makes all units similar but it is also here that waltz argues that there is a distinction between great powers and small powers and we come to the third point which is that even though units are alike there might be a great variation between them in terms of their military might in terms of their wealth in terms of their geographic reach and therefore waltz makes a distinction between great powers and small powers and it is it is great powers who shape the politics of the international domain and therefore waltz uh, stephen krasner john mearsheimer were preoccupied with the policies of great powers throughout times throughout time so in effect waltz uh, does something remarkable which is that he rests his theory on a clinically designed space and time whereby he is asking a question and he provides the answer to that question by shifting our focus away from the individual away from the state and arguing that it is anarchy anarchy is what shapes the world and it allows us to understand explain and describe uh at times confounding actions of the state which are unethical but nonetheless are necessary for the pursuit of foreign policy now waltz's theory from the time it was uh, published has been a uh, powerful and persuasive most importantly because it was swiftly canonized as one of the breakthrough theories within ir uh the notion of anarchy and the havoc that it wreaks upon uh, states is something which was also borrowed by the neo liberals so this addition the term neo uh, so while morgenthau is considered a realist waltz is a neo realist is because the neo bit is the shifting of the space of violence from the individual to the structure and therefore he is a structural realist because he is fundamentally looking at how the structure shapes units and how it homogenizes foreign policy and norms and behavior of the state so before we look at the reactions of a realist policy a realist theory and how it was received at the time just a few just to sum up what realism fundamentally is uh violence is an irreducible aspect of international politics ethic ethics has no space in that realm is what all realists broadly agree upon waltz is distinct in creating in conceptualizing a theory where it is the structure which shapes the units and units being the state so that this relationship between the structure and the unit is of tremendous importance when we look at the explanatory value of waltz's theory again waltz would tell us that the strength of a theory lies in what it can explain 
what it can describe and over here it has been remarkable successful in uh, describing as to how all states uh, spend vast amounts of money in militarization at the cost of human life, the quality of human life at the cost of poverty and social inequalities. It explains as to how the national interest is always prioritized ahead of other uh, internal politics. It also tells us that there is no force above the state and while the domestic order is that of hierarchy, outside is a space of anarchy where it is the might of the right and it is the great powers which define what politics is. So Kenneth Wall's text is of tremendous value on account of the simplicity, on account how parsimonious his theory is. It's an elegant book but of course it has, uh, there are several assumptions that Waltz make and all of these were questioned in, uh, in theories which critiqued and questioned neorealism itself. But the period that we are looking at is the 1970s and it is in this period that Waltz's theory makes a certain headway and a mark which uh, has stayed pretty much in its place and uh, there has been no scholar after Waltz to have uh, changed the conversation and shifted it away from conversation. So although there have been critiques uh, of Kenneth Waltz's neorealism, it has hovered around uh, neorealism itself in fundamental ways. Right, so before wrapping up our class on uh, uh, realism and neorealism, uh, just a few concepts which one, which one must run through. Uh, Waltz's theory is a theory of power where he is arguing that power is an inescapable part of the of international politics but the most important aspect of his theory is that he is arguing that it comes from this structure. The ordering principle of this structure is anarchy which compels states to uh, devote a large amount of their energy and resources on a militarization, on acquiring nuclear bombs even though they may not afford it. So just as an example, uh, the fact that India and Pakistan have uh, tested the nuclear bomb at enormous uh, financial cost points to the fact that the state's survival comes much ahead of its other uh, priorities within the state and it also leads us to the question of the security dilemma. Now the security dilemma is the dilemma where if a state increases its military possessions it thereby sets off a sense of anxiety and insecurity in its uh, fellow states. The fellow state would then proceed to similarly acquire uh, um, military weapons, strategic weapons of comparable uh, utility, thereby setting off an endless spiral of insecurity. So the security dilemma is that dilemma whereby the acquisitions of weapons uh, from which stems from fear uh, and the anxiety of being attacked is endless and infinite. It also points to the nuclearization of uh, uh, the world um, since 1948 when the first nuclear bomb, uh, 1945 since the first nuclear bomb was tested. So the security dilemma points to uh, how the structure uh, compels states to behave in ways uh, which are violent, militaristic and strategic. Another distinction which we can make within realism is that between offensive and defensive realism. The period in which Waltz is writing is the Cold War and bipolarity which is the balance between uh, two superpowers, two great powers is a uh, works for Waltz because it demonstrates as to how great powers balance the distribution of power and capabilities in the, within the structure.
But within that, Mayor Scheimer argues that we can also argue bet, or make a distinction between offensive and defensive realist. realism. Realism, uh, offensive realism would be where a great power tries to establish hegemony, which is that it tries to overtake every space uh, uh, within the world, within the structure and is hegemonic uh, in stifling all forms of opposition and that is an overreach and that is also an example when an empire overreaches or steps over its boundaries, it is also bound to collapse. A defensive realist, however, is one which tries to uh, respond to those imbalances by structuring it internally and therefore offensive and defensive realism are uh, modifications made of Waltz's theory of uh, neorealism where within great power politics, how great powers negotiate, navigate and adjust that uh, power, st uh, the, the struggle for power amongst themselves. So Waltz's theory is uh, insightful, it is incisive, it also tells us that great powers are the actors on the international stage and in the distribution of capabilities of the unit, it is, uh, uh, it are the great powers which uh, make decisions for uh, uh, subsequent small powers. So in effect, to wrap uh, the, the lecture on realism up, realism is a theory which is unapologetic about ethical questions, it shrugs them aside it pushes them aside. It also analyzes closely the roots of violence by looking into the sources of it. The first image like Hobbes uh, would argue that the source of violence is the individual. Uh, Morgenthau would argue that it is the state and of course uh, Waltz's uh, influential theory tells us that it is the structure which forces states to act in a, a, a prioritize their national interest above each other. Now, Waltz uses a particular term that units are uh, that states are socialized to act in a certain way, and it is this term which then becomes the platform upon which critical theorists, uh, feminists, and liberals to and constructivists to unravel and question the assumptions of Waltz's theory. So following the publication of Waltz's theory, uh, there have been in the 1980s several questions upon this and we will be looking at that in subsequent classes. Uh, in the next class, we will be looking at uh, feminism, liberalism, Marxism and these uh, theories have questioned the manner in which realism has been positioned and have rival explanations for the manner in which international politics has been designed. So I will see you in next class where we will be looking at another theory of international relations.